if we were to put 95 theses on our door today, what would they be? Why did Martin Luther do it in the first place? Well, something had to be done with these crazy things the church was doing, right? Purgatory, what is that? Something the Lutherans don't really attest to. It's either heaven or hell, right? This purgatory thing, to pay for members to leave purgatory, what, what is that all about? And just other things, too. My question is, what would we change today? I mean, we are a reforming church, right? We're born out of the Reformation, Reformation. How are we reforming today? And is that always a good thing? Or sometimes is it questionable? How are we open to new ideas or the way things are changing? I mean, Martin Luther really wanted people, the ordinary people, the folks to understand what was going on. You know, they didn't read or write, well, shouldn't say that. Um, they didn't read so much Latin or Greek or Hebrew. Uh, and so the people had to figure out from the priest to tell them what the Bible was saying. And, and Martin Luther said, no, it's for each person to read and understand and, and to take in for themselves. And so he spent time translating into German so that everyone could read. He also gave the people the large catechism so they could confirm their kids at home, so parents could teach their children. It was their jobs to teach the children. So he turned the tables quite a bit on the church at that time, and so they asked him to recant, of course, and he, he'd written many, many manuscripts and passed them around, tracts of, of theological arguments. And they told him to recant, and he said, I can't do that. Here is where I stand on these issues. What would we do today if we were to reform the church and put our theses on the door? Is our faith, are our faith practices and our theology written in stone? I mean, some people say, the Bible is clear about such and such and so and so. It's written in black and white. Obvious. This is the answer. Is it? Not to be argued, not to be debated or talked about, or other interpretations to be introduced? Hmm. What has changed since the Reformation? What have we done differently now? What kinds of things mark us as Lutherans? Now, there are different denominations of Lutherans, we know. When I tell my friends I'm Lutheran, but I'm the ELC Lutheran, tend to be a little bit more progressive in some ways. We let, you know, that women can be ordained, and, and even people who are gay or lesbian can be ordained and be pastors. A lot of things have changed since Martin Luther's time. Hmm. I'm reading a book by John Dominic Crossan, who is a priest and a biblical scholar. He and some others had what was called the Jesus Seminar from years ago, and they were uh, tracking the historical Jesus as best they could. But a deep man of faith. He's Irish, and so when you listen to him, you can hear that Irish inflection in his voice. Uh, in the book, he describes how God gives us good things and how sometimes we subvert it to evil. And we can all name instances of that. Even a friend of mine in the tech study group uh, who was a pastor said, you know, I went on the, on the ELC pastor website. This is a test. And I put something, I wrote something in there very good. You know, very positive. And I wanted to see how long it would take to go negative. He said, 12 minutes. He said, I don't understand that. He said, that's why I don't subscribe to the Facebook here anymore. Because we can take something that's really, really good and positive and put a spin on it and make it, because of our own issues, something to, it, that's not. Uh, twisting over time. And I think Martin Luther was looking at that kind of thing and say, you know what? The Catholic Church at that time was twisting things and making it its own. And they're kind of far from what Scripture's saying. And so he was very adamant about trying to set the record straight. Doesn't that sound familiar? People throughout the ages have been trying to do that. We call them prophets. We even have modern day prophets today. But I mean, isn't that what Jesus was talking about? Your Jewish faith is not evil in itself, but you missed the point. Here's how you really care about people and how you open the doors and how you open the doors to the faith 
of the Jewish people. I mean, back then, Midrash and, and arguing was part of what was going on with expanding and growing people's faith. They didn't simply say it. It says in black and white, and that's that, and that's what it's going to say, and that's what I believe. End of discussion. Because that's what we tend to do. So how are we reforming our church today? How does our, our theology continue to, to speak in a, a, a time of exciting Christianity? What's the next coolest thing? That, the next church that will be really explosive and, and entertaining and this and that, and then after a couple of years will go down because there's nothing to sustain them sometimes. What is it about our faith that sustains us, even if it seems kind of dull sometimes? What is it? What does Lutheran theology of today say about some controversial issues that plague the church? What would Martin Luther say about gay and lesbians who are clergy people and who wish to be married? What would Martin Luther say about our current political election process? He talked about two kingdoms. One was a civil, you know, that restrains evil and provides good boundaries. And it can be good and, and you know, pray for our government because... They are a way of, of you know, uh, of helping us. How would he look at this process that's going on and on and on? What would Martin Luther say about being revel, relevant in today's world? I was telling my brother the other day, she should get little bracelets, WWMLD. What would Martin Luther do? I said, no, that's a little sacrilegious, because, you know, the, the, arm, the wristbands of WWJD, what would Jesus do, were popular a few years ago. But what would we do as freed people of Christ? You know, in John it says that Jesus set us free. That sin is not, that stays in us. It's not making its house in our lives, in our bodies. That Jesus is the one who is replacing that and pushing it out. And he's the permanent place in our lives. That the Holy Spirit determines and governs us. I want you to look at your bulletin inserts for the Romans 3. Check it out. Verse 22. Just check it out. And I, I want to point out something that's, that's very interesting to think about. And it encapsulates Lutheran theology very well, I think. Uh, it says God's righteousness comes... Well, let me read. It's here somewhere. I have it written down. But um, Someone read 22 out loud so that I don't have it with me, the, the bill is an insert. I've got a different translation. Someone read the, the NRSV translation. Verse. The righteous faith in Jesus Christ. So the, the word is faith in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. Let me read you a translation that's a little more recent. It's under a lot of biblical scholarship too. God's righteousness comes through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ for all who have faith in him. You see the difference? Faith in Jesus or the faithfulness of Jesus. What does that tell you? In some ways, we take this, this good thing about faith in Jesus and we say, I'm in charge of this. It's up to me. Faith in Jesus, it's all up to me. It's what I do. This new translation, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, it's something Jesus does. Regardless of what I do or say or believe, it's the faithfulness of Jesus for us. God has faith in us. He believes in us to do the right thing. And that's Lutheran theology kind of almost in a nutshell. It's that justification by grace through faith, through the faith of Jesus Christ. His faithfulness set us free. His faithfulness will guide us. His faithfulness will bring us to eternal life. His faithfulness will make us whole. It, it, not even something we do. In confirmation class, we talk a bit about this. We're going through the creeds. And we ask the kids, what about uh, Osama bin Laden? Is he saved or not? Ooh. That's tough for any of us to answer, isn't it? Through this verse, yeah. Yeah, he and Adolf Hitler are both saved. It's the faithfulness of Jesus for all of us saints and sinners to bring us eternal life. That's, that's the gospel. That's the, the scandal of the gospel. That's the scandal of the resurrection of Jesus dying because in our terms of justice, that's not right. P. 
People should pay for all eternity for what they do in this life. And Jesus is setting us free from those kinds of things. It lets me off the hook, but it does not let me off the hook to do whatever I want because that's not living a gracious and honorable life. That's not a life that that God is believing in me to do the right thing, that I would just subvert it and do whatever I want. Because there are consequences in this life. There are people that I love and care about. There are people who are my neighbors, who I don't even realize are my neighbors, to do them harm, and it hurts in this life. There was a movie uh, written by, uh, based on the book from Victor Hugo, The Count of Monte Cristo. Uh, Edmond Dantes is, is the star of the show. He's the main character, and he is, he is railroaded and going into prison um, in, a, in an island way off, innocently thrown in jail because he had information that could hurt someone in power. He meets a priest who, who he becomes friends with, and they have tunnels back and forth in their cells. And the priest is a wise old man who used to be a soldier until he turned his life around. Sounds like Saul and Paul, right? He becomes a, a mentor to this young Edmond Dantes, and they are digging their way out of this hole, and they, they happen to find some roots, and they're getting close to, this, to, this, uh, to going to the outside. But the tunnel starts to collapse, and the priest is hit with rubble. And he, as Dante pulls him out and lays him out on the floor, the priest is dying. And uh, the priest tells Edmond to, to, to have faith that things are going to be okay. And, and Edmond tells the priest, he says, I don't, but I don't believe in God. Where the, in the last breath, the, pri- the priest says, it doesn't matter. God believes in you. Isn't that what it's all about? That God believes in us and hopes that we'll do the right thing and knowing full well that we, we, we often miss the mark, that we need to be brought back, that we need to reform and, and think about what our theology is all about to, to, to address issues in, in a thoughtful and, and wise way that we think this is who we are as Lutherans. We do because we love And because we are loved, and that always happens first and foremost, and regardless of what we do, we are always loved. In the Jeremiah scripture, it talks about the the God was saying, he he wrote it on your hearts. Um, In that passage, it's very, very telling in some ways. Uh, I will put my instructions within them and engrave them on their hearts. How often have we heard that? Engrave them on our hearts, the words of God on our hearts. In the Midrash, there's a story of a couple Jews, a a mentor, a disciple, and a rabbi. The disciple says to the rabbi, "Why, why is it that it says engrave on their hearts and not in their hearts? I would think it would be in their hearts. And And the old rabbi looked at him and said, he engraves it on their hearts, because the hearts need to be broken in order for the words to fill the heart. And we all know what that's all about. Sometimes we need our hearts to be broken in order to really, really hear the words. Sometimes when we're in our lowest moments, we can feel and hear the words of God clearer than any other time. And this is the God who embraces us and tells that this is the, the Jesus who comes to us, whose heart was broken for us so that we may be filled with life and hope and faithfulness to God. Amen.